In today's study of systematic theology, we're looking at the doctrine of Satan and sin. If you look at the chart as we begin our study, we need to go back and think about the time before the world existed when God created the angelic realm. When he created the angelic realm, he set one angel aside. That is, he created an angel most like himself, but because he is a created being, this angel, Lucifer, son of the morning, uh, will never be as powerful as God. Uh, he was designated to be the prime minister of heaven, if you will. Um, and we see that at some point, Satan decided to rebel against God. Uh, when he entered into this rebellion, he took a third of the angels with him, John tells us over in the book of Revelation. Uh, and that set up a paradigm where we have two groups of angels. We have those who were classified as the elect or unfallen angels, that is, those who did not take part in this heavenly rebellion. And then we have those who are known as fallen angels, which we later see in Scripture as demons. Now, in this group known as demons, there are those that are loose and active upon the earth, and then there are those that are confined. And in terms of their confinement, there are some of these angels that are temporarily confined, which will be released during the tribulation period, that time period known as Daniel's 70th week. And then there are those that are permanently confined and will remain so until the final judgment. Uh, I want us to understand that as we begin to talk about Satan, to realize that he is our adversary, that he's a very powerful being though he is not as powerful as, as God is. Uh, however, we should not take the view that, um, you know, he doesn't offer or pose a real threat to uh, the church and the Christian and his individual walk with Christ. Uh, for example, uh, there was a man who was dressed up as the devil going to a Halloween costume. It just happened to be on a Wednesday night when the church service was going on. And it began to rain very heavily outside. Well, to escape the rain, the man in the costume walked into the side door of the church and down into the front of the church where the congregation was immediately horrified to see the devil had showed up in their service. People began to jump up and scream and run toward the back of the church, all except for this guy who was sitting on the third row. Uh, the devil looked at him, shaking the water off of himself and said, I see everybody in here is terrified of me, but you don't seem to be scared at all. Why aren't you scared of me? And the man on the road looked at him and he said, Well, I've been married to your sister for 30 years. Why should I be scared of you? <laughs> and unfortunately, that's the view that many people have of the devil in the sense that they don't really take him serious, particularly as he's presented in the contemporary culture as wearing you know, a red outfit with the horns and the, the pitchfork and the tail, those are actually drawings that came about uh, during the medieval era uh, where, where the church was attempting to poke fun at the devil, if you will. But Satan is a very real creature. Uh, he is a person. He's not an ethereal force. Uh, it's not an it. Uh, he is an, uh, an angel, a created being. He has personality. He demonstrates intelligence. He demonstrates emotions, desires, and he also demonstrates that he has a will. Uh, for example, over in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul writes in reference to Satan, he says, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, and speaking of the man's original fall over in Genesis chapter 3, he says, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. And then over in Revelation chapter 12, John the Revelator, speaking of Satan, says this, So the dragon, that is Satan, was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who, kept, who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And then over in Luke chapter 22, Jesus talks to Simon Peter and he said this, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. So he demonstrates emotion, will, intellect. Uh, as a matter of fact, 
his fall, which many believe is recorded over in the book of Isaiah chapter 14, where you have Isaiah the prophet speaking of an earthly ruler, but back behind the earthly ruler is the operations of Satan. And he writes this over in verse 12 of chapter 14. He says, How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, now notice these statements, I will ascend to heaven, I will raise my throne above the stars of God, I will sit on the mount of the assembly, in the recesses of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will make myself like the most high. This is where Satan's rebellion, many theologians believe, occurs. And it was so convincing again that John the Revelator says that a third of the stars fell with him. Uh, this is not the only time Satan is mentioned in the Bible. If you notice on the chart that's included on the video, uh, you'll see that uh, there are many names that are given to Satan uh, in Scripture. And uh, we need to be mindful that he is a very active being in trying to thwart the purpose uh, of God uh, here upon the earth as God is working out his program. In many times and cases, uh, Satan is presented as a fierce opponent. Uh, John, the revelator again, uh, refers to him as a dragon over in Revelation chapter 12. But he can also appear as something that's non-threatening. For example, Paul says that he can appear as an angel of light over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. But make no mistake, mind you, of his objective. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5 that our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And a lion never roars until after he makes his kill. So we need to be mindful of that. So how do we as Christians resist Satan and temptation? Well, James, who's the half-brother of our Lord, said this over in James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, notice here what James says. He doesn't say that we have to bind Satan, rebuke Satan, and so forth. What he's saying is, submit therefore to God through the revealed will of God, that is the scriptures, and by doing so, by yielding to the scriptures and the way that we think, the way that we speak, the way that we act, that by doing so, the devil will flee from us. Now, what is it that causes him to flee? Well, if we resist and submit to God, it says, and the verb, he will flee, a middle passive verb, meaning that Satan will flee in and of himself when we submit uh, ourselves to the Lord and his word. Uh, the Apostle Paul puts it this way over in Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And he says, do not be conformed to this world. By that, what he's saying is, don't be conformed to this world's way of thinking. Rather, be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. That is, that we begin to think God's thoughts after him as we take in the word of God and we begin to ponder and reflect about what those truths mean for us and then we begin to apply those truths in life. Uh, in Galatians chapter 5, Paul will add this. He'll say, but I say walk, that is uh, figure of speech to mean how you arrange or order your life. Walk by means of the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. And then over in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says this, in terms of our temptation or testing. And he says, no temptation, and the word there could also be translated as testing. The context will normally determine how it's used, and by temptation or testing here, we're talking about a test or possibly a solicitation to engage or commit evil. Uh, he says, no temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape. Uh, the word there in the Greek has the prefix ek, from where we get our English word exit. Uh, 
uh, what Paul is saying is that if we stand fast to God and his word, that with the testing and temptation that comes before us as we live out our lives, that God provides for us uh, a path, uh, a way of escape that is an exit so that we will be able to endure the test or overcome or avoid the temptation. But the thing that we need to remember is that the spiritual warfare that takes place occurs between your ears. That is, the battlefield is in the mind. It's a fight for your thinking. MacArthur puts it this way. He says, spiritual warfare is not a battle with demons. It is a battle for the minds of people who are captive to lies that are exalted in opposition to scripture. And that's really what we're talking about when we talk about spiritual warfare. We're talking about a conflict of worldviews. Uh, Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 10, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. And then he says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. He says, We are destroying speculations. That is, reasons or arguments or viewpoints. We're destroying speculations and every lofty thing, that is, every lofty unbelieving worldview or philosophy of man that is raised up, that is, is partitioned up against the knowledge of God. And how are we doing that? Well, Paul says that we're doing it this way. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So when we hear something out in the world, Perhaps it's a new philosophy. Perhaps it's a new idea. What Paul is saying is that we need to take that philosophy or take that idea, regardless of the source, and then compare that to what Scripture teaches. And if it comports with what Scripture teaches, then embrace it. If it doesn't comport with what Scripture teaches, then reject it. And that's what it means to take every thought captive uh, to the obedience of Christ. So that's a little bit about Satan. Now, let's talk a little bit about sin. Sin comes to us from Adam and Eve, that is, original sin. You'll recall in Genesis chapter 3, God placed Adam and Eve in the garden. They uh, sinned against God by eating of the forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. As a result of this original sin, all of Adam and Eve's posterity are affected by sin. They're affected by sin, uh, inherited sin, and they are also affected by imputed sin. And there's a couple of verses that we find in the New Testament that really clarify this. Um, so let's talk a little bit about inherited and imputed sin. Inherited sin is that sinful state into which all people are born into. Uh, labels that are related to this concept or term of inherited sin would include sin nature, that is, we have a sinful nature, uh, and we uh, engage uh, in sin because we have a sin nature. That is, we don't become sinners after we commit personal sin. We engage in personal sins because we are already constituted sinners in Adam. Uh, and sin affects man at all levels. It affects his mind, that is, uh, his intellect is blinded because of sin. Uh, man's mind is reprobate because of sin. He is darkened in his understanding, meaning he doesn't have the capacity to know God and experience God's life. He is alienated from God. Uh, man's uh, emotions are defiled, and his will is enslaved to his sin nature, uh, which stands in direct opposition to God. That's why Paul, in his indictment of the whole of humanity that we find in Romans chapter 1 through chapter 3, where Paul says it this way, in reference to the whole of humanity, when he says, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside together, have become useless, and notice what he says here. There is none who does good. There is not even one. That's a universal negative, meaning there's no one without exception. He says their throat is an open grave. With their tongues, they keep deceiving. The poison of asper 
serpents or snakes is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And David would go on to say this in Psalm 14, 1, at the foundation of all of their thinking, they say in their heart, uh, there is no God. So that's how inherited sin affects us. Uh, it comes to us from the father's side of the transaction through the procreation process. That is, the sin nature is passed on to me from my father and his father before him, and so on, all the way back to uh, Adam. So uh, in light of this inherited sin, we must be mindful that we are also uh, sinners through the process of uh, imputed sin. That is, when Adam sinned, his sin was imputed to the whole of the human race. And there's a couple of different use, views that demonstrate how this is the case. Uh, for example, uh, the imputation of sin. To impute means to attribute or reckon or ascribe something to someone else. Now, before we really get bent out of shape and just uh, thinking that imputation, the imputation view doesn't seem fair, uh, remember that there are three types of imputations that we see in Scripture. We see Adam's sin imputed to the whole of the human race, and we see man's sin imputed to Christ, that is, those who believe and trust in him for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And as a result, Christ's righteousness is imputed to the man and woman who believes or trusts in him. Now, this concept is developed for us over in the book of Romans, as Paul writes in verse 12. Therefore, as through one man, sin entered into the world and death through sin, so that death spread, that is, death passed through or permeate, permeated uh, to all men. Why? Because Paul says all sin, that is, all sinned in Adam. Death was brought about by one, and, and what Paul's doing here is making a comparison and contrast between Adam and Christ. Uh, for example, uh, man in Adam experiences death, that is separation from God. So Adam brought death into God's created order, whereas Jesus gives life to God's created order. Um, in verse 16 and 17 of Romans chapter 5, we see that Adam brought condemnation, whereas Jesus brought liberation. Uh, Adam's disobedience made man subject to sin and death, and Jesus' obedience made man free from sin's consequences and gave him life. Uh, the law, that is the Mosaic law, reveals the sinfulness of man Yet the grace of God surpasses the sinfulness of man. And so that's uh, one facet of this concept of imputed sin uh, that Paul speaks of and how we are impacted by that. Uh, another way which scripture tells us, and I know some theologians look at either one of these, uh, the representative view or, or what's referred to as the seminal view. I actually think that it's probably a combination of both. Uh, for example, over in Hebrews chapter 7, the writer to the Hebrews is comparing the Melchizedekian priesthood of whom which uh, Christ is the high priest. He's comparing that with the Levitical priesthood of which you recall Aaron was the high priest. Um, and he's making a comparison between those two types or kinds of priesthoods. And then he's drawing upon the story of Abraham when Abraham comes to pay a tithe or a tenth to Melchizedek. And so what the writer says is this, so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, and you'll recall Levi was a descendant of Abraham. You have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then Levi was one of the sons of Jacob. And so Levi, who received tithes, that is under the Levitical priesthood, the Levites received tithes from the children of Israel. And what the writer is doing here in Hebrews is he's saying that Levi was in the loins of Abraham who received tithes. And by doing so, when Abraham paid a tithe to Melchizedek, 
what he's saying is by proxy that Levi was paying a tithe to Melchizedek. And the way that he's able to make this argument, he says, is that for he was still in the loins or body of his father Abraham when Melchizedek met him. So the lesser is paying tithes to the greater. And so that's one of the arguments that he's using to demonstrate the superiority of the Melchizedekian priesthood there. But that also demonstrates for us that um, how one can be a sinner. That is how we were made sinners through the process of imputation in that when Adam sinned as our representative, uh, we somehow participated in that sin. And Paul makes that clear. When Adam sinned, we sinned. Now, how that works itself out, we may not know until we get to the other side of glory. However, uh, Paul is writing under apostolic authority. And so the Holy Spirit writing through him says that when Adam sinned, we sinned. And beloved, this is why through the process of inherited and imputed sin, we commit personal sins. Personal sin is the sin that we commit on a daily basis. Uh, there are many examples of personal sins that we find in Scripture, such as lying, uh, demonstrating partiality to other people, uh, demonstrating uh, carnality. Uh, and then Paul gets uh, very specific in certain books, speaking of sin as sorcery and immorality and uh, factions and uh, using our tongue wrongly and envying. And so there's a whole host of personal sins uh, that we struggle with on a daily basis. Uh, what results because of personal sin for the believer is a loss of fellowship with God. Um, that doesn't mean we lose our salvation, that is that we lose our relationship with God, but it does mean that we lose our fellowship with Him and our fellowship with other believers. As a result, the scripture gives clear evidence to us that there are certain means and methods that we use uh, whenever we confront a persistently or consistently sinning brother or sister in Christ. Some of these penalties would include excommunication. Of course, this presupposes that we follow the prescriptions set forth by the Lord in Matthew chapter 18, where one of us goes to a brother or sister in Christ and confronts them. Uh, and then if that doesn't work, we take two or more with us. If that doesn't work, we bring it before the church. And if that still doesn't work, then... Uh, would possibly be the time to uh, excommunicate or to remove the fellowship uh, from that persistently sinning brother or sister in Christ. Uh, another penalty for the persistently sinning Christian is that we can expect God's temporal judgment, God's punishment uh, to a believer uh, in the case of persistent sin is always to be viewed as corrective rather than punitive. Uh, the writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 6 tells us that one of the options that God has is that uh, believers who persistently persist in sinning and not growing up in the faith run the risk of God confirming them in a state of immaturity. Meaning, as a parent would send a rebellious child up to their room, uh, in a sense, God could send the persistently sinning Christian to their room uh, until that time as they either the Lord returns or uh, potentially they experience uh, physical death. Now, Paul will go on to say, however, brethren, we're con convinced of much better things for you. So whether that's a hypothetical type of argument, uh, that is something that appears to be at least on the table. Uh, even though for the uh, writer to the Hebrews, that's something that does not come to fruition. Another view is the loss of rewards view, uh, meaning that when a Christian persistently sins and refuses to grow up in the faith, they run the risk of forfeiting uh, re rewards and inheritance at the judgment seat or the bema of Christ. And then the fourth option that we find in Scripture is that in some cases, God allows physical infirmaries or death to be a form of temporal or corrective punishment. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, Paul says in reference to those who were partaking of the Lord's Supper in an irreverent manner, that some are sick and some are weak and some even sleep. That is, God decided to bring them on 
home because they were making too much of a mess down here on the earth. Uh, and then the Apostle John writes over in 1 John chapter 5 that there is a sin that leads unto death. John never indicates for us what this sin is other than it's probably some type of an egregious sin that is publicly known, whatever that sin unto death is. But those are options uh, that we see in Scripture for persistently sinning Christians. Uh, now, what's the remedy for personal sin? Well, for someone who's an unbeliever, my advice to you would be that of what Paul tells the Philippian jailer. Uh, put your faith and trust in Christ and believe in him for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life, and you will be saved. Believe in him, trust in him. Uh, that's one of the remedies for sin. Uh, this remedy for sin for the uh, disobedient believer is given to us over in 1 John 1, 9. To confess our sin before Christ and repent of the sin, and he will restore us into fellowship. Uh, that is, uh, our experiential joy is based upon our trust in God, our service to others, and our obedience to the law of Christ. And so we need to be busy about that task. And if sin has separated us again from that task, then confess our sin, repent of our, our sin, uh, and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness and restore us into active fellowship with him. That's why Paul could say over in Ephesians 1, in him, that is in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Now we've talked a lot today about Satan and sin and sin's consequence. But beloved, God has given us a grace that far surpasses anything that is sinful uh, in this life. Um, you know, today's a little bit uh, special for us because for those of you who are watching this videotape, today is the memorial service of Dr. Ravi Zacharias, who was a leading apologist here of the 20th and early 21st century. Uh, and he would make it his ministry to go around and share uh, the truth of the gospel and uh, to various college campuses all the way from Texas A&M, all the way over to Oxford in England. And he was a bold evangelist and apologist. And he used to say this poem, and I want to leave it with you today, but he would always often cite this poem uh, to encourage people to trust in him whose grace surpasses all sin. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limit, his grace has no measure, his power has no boundary, known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. Join us next time as we continue our study of systematic theology.